Chapter 51 The Canary Wharf Riders and the New Term The Hogwarts Express chugged along the tracks, its steam whistle echoing through the countryside. Hermione, having searched every compartment with growing concern, finally confirmed, Harry and Ron are not on the train. Upon hearing this, John, who had been leisurely enjoying a chocolate frog, paused mid-bite. A thought crossed his mind. Perhaps they missed the train. It's not a big deal. We can just write to the school and they'll arrange for someone to pick them up. As he popped the remainder of the chocolate frog into his mouth, John turned his attention to Neville. Since visiting his parents over the holidays, Neville had seemed noticeably more subdued. Neville, are you all right? John inquired, his tone gentle. Neville, caught off guard, hesitated before nodding. I'm fine, John. Here, have some toffee, John offered, pressing the sweet into Neville's hands. His thoughts briefly lingered on Neville's parents and the devastating effects of the unforgivable curses they had endured. John himself felt a pang of guilt recalling his own use of the Cruciatus curse, resolving to avoid it whenever possible. Lost in thought, John's gaze drifted to the window just in time to spot a black dot in the distance, rapidly approaching. He blinked, disbelieving, as a familiar flying car zoomed past the train, its occupant's moth screams barely audible over the wind. Mr. Wick, you're flying in the wrong direction, came a voice from within, followed by a panicked, no, we're falling. John watched in stunned silence as the car veered off course, narrowly missing the bridge the train had just crossed, before disappearing from sight. I could swear that was my father, he muttered to himself. If he wasn't mistaken, the car had been carrying three passengers, Harry, Ron, and his father, Watson Wick. John couldn't help but marvel at his father's audacity to pilot a flying car as if it were no different from driving on the road. All I can do is pray that Harry and Ron emerge unscathed, he murmured, folding his hands in a silent prayer, leaving Hermione looking on in confusion. Canary Wharf Car God? John mused, then quickly reassured Hermione, Don't worry, Harry and the others will be fine. He added silently to himself, Hopefully. Thank you, John. Hermione replied, her anxiety somewhat alleviated. She couldn't help but wonder if Harry and Ron would have the sense to write to the school for help. Meanwhile, Harry and Ron were regretting their decision to trust Watson Wick, who seemed reliable at first glance. John, John, Ron shouted in desperation, convinced that only John could save them from their reckless uncle. Harry, having hit his head on the car's roof for the tenth time, silently agreed. Despite the car's sturdy build, Harry feared his head might not withstand much more. Watson, on the other hand, was thoroughly enjoying himself. With a casual flick of the wrist, he sent the car hurtling through the air at breakneck speed. Long live the Canary Wharf car god, he cheered, his exuberance contrasting sharply with Harry and Ron's cries of terror. Upon arriving at Hogwarts, the second-year students were greeted not by the familiar boats across the Black Lake, but by a line of horseless carriages outside Hogsmeade Station. Hermione, ever curious, wondered aloud, what pulls these carriages? It's the Thestrals, magical creatures visible only to those who have faced death, John explained, his gaze fixed on the invisible beings leading their carriage. The realization that he could see them, likely due to witnessing Professor Quirrell's demise, sent a shiver down his spine. As they boarded the carriage, Daphne Greengrass, a Slytherin girl hurried to join them, her actions betraying her intention to be near John. Hi, John. Long time no see, she greeted, her attempt at nonchalance failing to mask her true motives. John responded with a polite smile, welcoming her and the others to share the carriage ride to Hogwarts. When he saw her, he greeted her warmly. Despite being in the same house, his interactions with other Slytherins were minimal. Apart from Malfoy and his two cronies, Daphne was the one he conversed with the most, though their total exchanges didn't exceed ten sentences. Upon seeing Daphne, Hermione immediately felt a surge of natural hostility, a testament to the inexplicable intuition women often possess. She glared at Daphne, who responded by flicking her blonde hair back proudly, shimmering like satin under the night sky. Neville sensed the atmosphere cooling. Was it simply because night had fallen? The interior of the carriage was dim, filled with a faint musty scent mingled with straw. Once all the students were aboard, a procession of a hundred carriages made its way toward Hogwarts, following the dirt path. 
Pulled by Thestrals, they approached the main entrance, where winged boars stood guard on either side. The journey continued up the driveway, culminating at the stone steps of the Oak Gate, the grand entrance to Hogwarts Castle. From there, the students made their way into the Great Hall, soon joined by the first-year students who had arrived by the Black Ship. Hermione scanned the room for Harry and Ron, feeling uneasy upon noticing John also taking his seat at the Slytherin table. Malfoy intended to sit next to John, but Daphne quickly claimed the seat for herself. This is my place. Malfoy expressed his displeasure, but a single glance from Daphne, laden with clear intent, made him reconsider. Ahem, perhaps a change in perspective will be beneficial, he mused, acknowledging Daphne's pure blood lineage, which rivaled his own. With a sense of begrudging gallantry, Malfoy found a seat across from John. John remarked to Malfoy, Draco, you've grown taller. Delighted by the observation, Malfoy eagerly inquired, Really? By how much? John gestured broadly before adjusting to indicate a modest increase. About this much. Malfoy was thrilled, sharing his ambitious plans for the semester, including his father's promise to donate Nimbus 2001 brooms to the team. With me as seeker, we'll surely outmatch Potter, he boasted, unaware of the unfair advantage this provided. John, however, believed Malfoy's skills were sufficient without resorting to such measures. Your flying is commendable, Draco. There's no need for shortcuts, he advised, a sentiment Malfoy appreciated, though his father would disagree. As the sorting ceremony commenced, John's attention was drawn to Ginny Weasley's unmistakable red hair. Snape was conspicuously absent, likely in pursuit of Harry and the others. John's speculation was confirmed when Snape entered the Great Hall with a stern expression, summoning, John Wick, come with me. Malfoy, sensing the tension, whispered, What did you do? I've never seen Professor Snape so irate. Please, don't let us lose points. John, puzzled, could only respond, I don't know, but I must go, before departing under Daphne's concerned gaze. In Snape's office, surrounded by bottles and jars filled with potion ingredients and creature parts, John faced his living father, realizing the source of Snape's displeasure. John couldn't help but press his fingers to his forehead, a gesture of exasperation, as he observed Professor Snape. The irony of the situation was not lost on him. A man who had been deceived by the patriarch of another family was now, in turn, deceiving his own son. The complexity of Snape's character was evident in his actions, a blend of bitterness and a desperate attempt to protect, albeit in a misguided way. As John's gaze met Snape's, he was met with a look that could only be described as murderous. Despite the intensity of Snape's glare, John sensed an underlying vulnerability. It was a look that spoke volumes of Snape's internal struggle. A man caught between the world of deceit he had woven around himself and the stark reality of his actions. Feeling a surge of determination, John believed that Snape was not beyond redemption. The path to saving him from the web of lies and resentment he had entangled himself in would not be easy, but John felt compelled to try. He understood that Snape's actions, however misguided, stemmed from a place of deep-seated pain and a flawed sense of duty. In that moment, John realized the importance of empathy and understanding. He knew that to reach Snape, he would need to navigate the complex layers of his persona to offer a semblance of hope in the darkness that had consumed him. It was a daunting task, but John was ready to undertake it, driven by a belief in the power of redemption and the human capacity for change. Chapter 52. Punishment and Flying Boots John Wick, with genuine concern, inquired, Professor, will this incident result in a deduction of my points? His question only served to darken Professor Snape's already grim expression. Mr. Wick, your muggle father has not only illegally breached Hogwarts' defenses, but also damaged the exceedingly rare humping willow, Snape said, his voice laced with disbelief and irritation, particularly at the thought of muggles maneuvering a flying car. He then sarcastically referenced a report from the Evening Prophet. Furthermore, a group of muggles witnessed an old car flying over the post office. This incident has breached the statute of secrecy, and Mr. Watson Wick's unauthorized entry into Hogwarts is a grave violation of our school's regulations. Upon hearing Snape's words, John's demeanor turned serious, realizing the gravity of the situation. Even Professor McGonagall and Dumbledore were taken aback by the news. Harry and Ron, meanwhile, 
trembled with fear, and Watson Wick, the man at the center of the controversy, seemed to grasp the extent of his actions and their potential to mislead his son. Professor, should there be consequences, let them fall on me. Spare the children any embarrassment, Watson declared, standing tall and earning the admiration of Harry and Ron for his adult responsibility. Professor McGonagall, wearing a stern expression, entered the room. Harry half expected her to transform herself in anger, but instead she simply lit the fireplace with her wand and invited everyone to sit. Explain yourselves, she demanded, her tone reminiscent of catching them on an unauthorized night excursion the previous year. Harry and Ron, seizing a glimmer of hope, quickly defended themselves. Please, don't blame us. The barrier at the station wouldn't let us through. They explained the malfunction at the platform, but McGonagall, unimpressed, retorted sharply, Why didn't you send an owl? Surely, you have one, don't you? Harry, realizing the oversight, was at a loss for words. McGonagall then turned to Watson Wick, who remained silent, understanding that this matter was beyond her jurisdiction and best handled by Dumbledore himself. Dumbledore, upon his arrival, did not offer his usual smile. Mr. Wick, it's unfortunate that we meet again under these circumstances, he said, addressing Watson with a tone of regret. Watson, feeling the weight of his actions, admitted, it's all my fault, Professor Dumbledore. I shouldn't have involved my children in this. Dumbledore responded, Mr. Wick, were you a student, I would write to your parents. However, I will simply arrange for your return home and trust you will keep this matter to yourself. This was a relief to Watson, sparing him from a potential obliviate charm. Turning to John, Dumbledore assigned him a unique punishment. John, you are to tend to the humping willow until it has fully recovered. John, though frustrated by the unfairness of bearing the consequences of his father's actions, accepted the task, recognizing Dumbledore's leniency. Dumbledore then addressed Harry and Ron, who braced themselves for the worst. We're expelled, aren't we? Ron asked despairingly. Dumbledore, maintaining a stern demeanor, assured them, Not today, Mr. Weasley. However, I will inform your families of this incident and warn you that any further misconduct will result in expulsion. This outcome visibly irritated Professor Snape, who found it unjust that no points were deducted, especially considering that the incident occurred before the term started. Snape's protest highlighted his frustration with what he perceived as favoritism, igniting his eagerness to deduct points in the future. John couldn't possibly blame himself, right? He was the sole Slytherin student there, while Harry and his companion were under the watchful eye of Professor McGonagall from Gryffindor. Don't rush to send Mr. Wick to the station just yet. Upon witnessing John's expression, Professor Snape's face darkened, teetering on the edge of fury be, for settling into a sardonic tone. John, not one to make a mockery of himself, escorted his living father, Watson Wick, to the station with a sense of duty. At the station, Hagrid was already waiting. He waved eagerly upon spotting John approaching. Hagrid, please, John implored with genuine relief at seeing the familiar face. If my father causes any trouble, feel free to knock him out. Thank you. This unusual request from a seemingly dutiful son prompted Watson Wick to voice his protest, to which Hagrid responded with an awkward smile, assuring he wouldn't resort to such measures. John, however, had a trump card up his sleeve. With a calm demeanor, he simply stated, I'll write to my mother. This threat effectively silenced Watson. Upon his return home, Mrs. Wick, having received the letter, was there to greet him. It was rumored that Watson took a week off work, citing illness, too apprehensive to face his colleagues after the incident. Ding, the second phase of the Hogwarts task begins. Complete the second school year as a magic apprentice. Reward, plus one to magical bloodline, three to any attribute. Ding, a new task has been triggered. Nurture the Whomping Willow back to health and receive the Botanist blessing. Botanist, increases the success rate of cultivating plants. Ding, a challenge task has been triggered. Maintain the highest grades in your year until the end of the semester and receive plus one to any attribute along with the diligent and studious blessing. Diligent and studious, studying for more than two hours continuously grants an additional hour of enhanced efficiency. Activating the system now, are you testing to see if I'll be expelled? John mused after his father's departure as the second phase at Hogwarts commenced. 
He had his suspicions that the system's timing was a test, pondering if his earlier actions might have led to his expulsion. Thankfully, everything was still on track. Dumbledore was not like Principal Phineas Nigellus Black, who was notoriously the most disliked principal in Hogwarts history. If he were, John speculated that three students might have been sent packing that day. Having missed dinner, John decided to visit the kitchen to see if he could secure a meal. It was considered a great honor among the Hogwarts house elves to serve a wizard. After obtaining his dinner, John opted not to return to his dormitory, but instead headed to the Room of Requirement. After pacing back and forth in front of the large tapestry three times, he entered the training room, which he hadn't visited in a while, and found covered in a new layer of dust. With a flick of his wand, John cleared the dust, sending it out the window. He then retrieved the Ironwick sword from his bag. Simultaneously, he donned a pair of flying boots, which adjusted to fit his feet perfectly. The boots, initially too large, now felt as comfortable as if he were barefoot. The feather of a rune horse is lighter than a spider's silk and enchanted with a levitation spell, John noted as he tapped his heel, causing two wings to extend from the sides of the boots. With a single leap, he soared three meters into the air, the small wings fluttering to keep him aloft. Gripping the Ironwick sword, John uttered a spell, imbuing the blade with magic. I am a fire dragon, he declared. As the incantation was completed, the sword spell ignited a red glow and flames danced along the blade. A dozen large humanoid targets appeared in the training area, suspended in midair. With the flaming sword in hand, John slashed through them, each target neatly bisected, flames erupting from the cuts. Without the need for a wand, John effortlessly destroyed all the targets. Amidst the flames, he landed on the ground, surveying the destruction he had wrought. He then called out to the training ground, hard mode. The training ground offered four levels of difficulty, training, entry, intermediate, and master. John was ready to challenge himself further, pushing his limits in this magical and demanding environment. John stood in the training room, his gaze fixed on the stationary training dummy before him. It was designed solely for testing purposes, offering no movement or resistance. However, the real challenge lay ahead, as the training session was about to escalate. At the outset, participants were faced with a target that merely dodged, providing a basic level of difficulty. But as the stakes were raised, an attacking automaton, eerily reminiscent of a puppet, would emerge to confront them. This was the hard mode, a level John had previously attempted but failed to conquer, primarily due to the inadequacy of his sword. Now, armed with a new weapon, a sense of determination washed over John. He was eager to test his mettle against the formidable challenge that had bested him before. With a decisive command, the humanoid target that had been the focus of his attention was swiftly retracted, making way for a more daunting trial. From the depths of the fireplace, five figures emerged, each bearing a striking resemblance to a wizard. These were no ordinary targets. They were the attacking puppets designed to simulate a real combat scenario. As soon as they appeared, they wasted no time in launching their assault on John. The air in the training room grew tense as John readied himself, his grip tightening around the hilt of his new sword. The puppets advanced, their movements eerily lifelike, as they closed in on him. John knew that this was his moment to prove that he could overcome the challenge that had once defeated him. With a deep breath, he stepped forward to meet his adversaries, his resolve as sharp as the blade in his hand. Chapter 53 Mastering Difficult Mode and Adapting to Training Field Changes As one of the five dolls emerged, it dashed towards John, brandishing a wooden sword. John swiftly raised his own sword to block the attack, then with a fluid motion, sidestepped and delivered a slashing blow to the puppet's waist. The speed and damage have both increased, John observed, turning to regard the doll he had bisected. He reflected on the blessing he had received at the end of the last school year. Night, when wielding a sword with both hands, your power significantly increases, and it further amplifies when mounted. This particular blessing had cost him two large margins, but John felt it was well earned, considering the risks he had taken to obtain it. In the previous semester, battling a puppet had nearly brought him to his knees, even without a direct hit. Despite being made of wood, 
The puppet's swords were incredibly hard and heavy, capable of puncturing the ground with a casual swing. Today I'll conquer the difficult mode, John declared, his spirits high as the second puppet advanced. Its speed was remarkable, charging towards him. John steadied himself, and then cast. Reducto. A beam of white light struck the doll, shattering it into pieces. Holding his wand in his left hand, John nodded in satisfaction at the spell's enhanced effect. With the growth of my magical experience, the potency of my spells has also increased, he mused, not just focusing on swordsmanship. However, his actions seemed to provoke the remaining puppets. In an instant, three puppets launched an attack simultaneously. One exhibited immense strength, another unmatched speed, and the third demonstrated agility and the occasional spellcasting. John's expression darkened as he struggled to fend off the attacks while remaining vigilant against potential spells. The relentless assault quickly overwhelmed him, and a red light from one of the wizard puppets sent him flying out of the training area. He landed hard, feeling nauseous and vomited, a slug slipping out in the process. Damn it! The shock of the sight triggered another wave of nausea, and more slugs appeared. Frantically, John grabbed his wand to dispel the curse. He had removed his amulet for training, not anticipating a minor yet humiliating curse from the puppet. A mage, an assassin, and a warrior, John analyzed after clearing the spell and disposing of the slugs. The trio's synergy was impeccable. One engaged him head-on, another distracted him from the side, and the third delivered powerful attacks. This combination made John feel as though he was a boss character, being overwhelmed by a coordinated team. After several attempts and managing to dispel the effects that had enlarged his front teeth, John conceded, Fighting these three is challenging. Perhaps it would be easier if I leveled up. He summoned his panel to review his stats. Magic Power, Level 3, Thal 85 1500. Spells, Levitation Charm, Level 4. Transfiguration, Level 2, with Dragon Option. Disillusionment Charm, Level 4. Fiery Flames, Level 4. Bone Crushing Spell, Level 3. Fiery Blast, Level 3. Mind Blocking Spell, Level 4. Skills, Short Weapon Mastery, Great Sword Mastery, Level 4. Firearms Mastery, Level 1. Runes Mastery, Level 2. Alchemy Master, Level 2. Blessings, Physical Fitness, Quick Attack, Precision, Scholar 2.0. Pilot, Long Distance Running, Sword Dance, Night Devil, Troll Buster, Knight, Fire Swallower, Deterrence, Hardening, Dragon Speech. Although his great sword skill was at level 4, it seemed insufficient against the puppet trio. John contemplated upgrading, but hesitated due to his limited random points. Forget it. Hogwarts is safe for now, he reasoned, deciding to conserve his resources. The spirit of adventure and challenge within him remained undaunted, ready to face whatever the training field or Hogwarts had in store next. Refusing to admit defeat and still feeling the sting of disgust from earlier, John decided to dismantle the three dolls as a way to vent his frus, Tration. With a light tap, he activated the mastery of the great sword, and instantly his familiarity with the weapon intensified. Reflecting on his previous battles, John realized the folly in what he once considered a perfect defense. It was as if, through thousands of repetitions, he had reacquainted himself with the sword, now wielding it as naturally as one of his own limbs. A weapon is an extension of a limb, he mused, focusing intently on the three dolls before him. As they advanced, their gaze collectively fixed on John. Come on, I am the fire dragon, he whispered, reigniting the flames along Ironwick's blade. John launched the first attack, charging forward with the ferocity of a wild horse. The warrior doll moved to intercept, its wooden sword slashing downwards. Instead of retreating, John met the attack head-on, holding his sword with both hands. He narrowly avoided the wooden blade, his body brushing dangerously close as he swung his great sword, cutting through the air to strike the warrior doll. Suddenly, a red light darted towards John. With a swift stomp of his right foot, he dodged, allowing the light to miss his blade by inches. Almost immediately, he sensed an attack from behind, an assassin puppet strike. John's sword swung out in a reflexive block, using the back of his sword to deflect the blow. The warrior doll, seizing the moment, attacked once more. John, with a quick flick of his wrists, repelled the assassin and brought his sword down in a powerful arc, severing the sword-holding hand of the warrior doll. 
As the mage puppet launched another attack, John seized the opportunity to draw his wand, casting the iron armor curse to block the spell. Simultaneously, he pivoted on his left foot, hurling the great sword with his right hand. The sword's hilt slid through his palm, extending the blade as if by magic, just in time to impale the assassin puppet sneaking up from behind. With one doll disabled and another impaled, only the mage puppet continued its barrage of spells. John, persisting with the iron armor curse for defense, countered with a spell of his own, striking the one-armed warrior doll and rendering it incapacitated. Advancing towards the mage doll, John noted the significant difference in mobility between the mage and the assassin. With a flick of his wand, he launched a ball of white light that struck the mage, sending it flying. Seizing the moment, John's sword, ablaze with the fire of iron wick, pierced through the mage doll, the flames consuming it instantly. The challenge was finally over. A sense of relief washed over John as the weight of his frustration lifted. He sat down, feeling rejuvenated. If this is only level five, what does the master level entail? He pondered, his curiosity about the higher levels peaked. The thought of facing challenges of this magnitude made him wonder if one would have to confront Voldemort alone. It seemed unlikely. As John rested, the wooden sword in the corner began to transform. The once crude, oversized sword shrank, shedding excess material that fell to the ground and took on a human-like form. Meanwhile, in the principal's office, Dumbledore had just returned from attending to some matters. He noticed the sword of Gryffindor trembling slightly. Approaching it with a look of astonishment, he was interrupted by the sorting hat. Albus, it said, prompting Dumbledore to turn, a realization dawning on him. Is he back? It wasn't him. It was his secret chamber that was opened, the sorting hat clarified. As the keeper of Hogwarts secrets, the sorting hat was privy to the deepest mysteries of the school. Dumbledore, intrigued, stepped closer to the sorting hat and inquired, Who is it? The founder of the Fourth Academy has always been enigmatic, Dumbledore mused, his thoughts drifting to the legacies left behind by the founders of Hogwarts. Each of the four houses had its own unique inheritance, much like the Chamber of Secrets of Slytherin that had once been revealed. The man mentioned by the Sorting Hat was undoubtedly Gryffindor, Gryffindor's Chamber of Secrets. Could it be you, Harry? Dumbledore pondered. He believed that such a chamber would only open for a worthy successor, and who better than the prophesied savior, Harry Potter? The sword of Gryffindor ceased its trembling, prompting Dumbledore to delve deeper into his thoughts. Could it be sensing the impending danger as well? He wondered. Meanwhile, John had taken enough time to rest and decided it was time to return. Rising to his feet, he turned to retrieve the sword he had plunged into the dummy. The flames that once danced along its blade were now extinguished, and the spell's red glow had faded. As he turned to leave, he paused, sensing a presence. Standing before him was a young man, adorned with a wizard's hat, his gaze fixed on John. In that moment, John felt as though he was the prey under the watchful eye of a lion. The atmosphere was charged with an unspoken tension, a silent acknowledgement of the challenges that lay ahead. John, aware of the gravity of the situation, knew that the path forward was fraught with danger and mystery. The legacy of Gryffindor, the impending peril, and the role he was to play in the unfolding events were all pieces of a puzzle he was yet to fully understand. Chapter 54 The Inheritance Test and the Roaring Letter The man before John had red hair cascading over his shoulders, a handsome visage, and a beard adorning his chin. His skin seemed to be flecked with sawdust, giving him an almost wooden appearance. An alarm bell rang in John's mind. Silently, he clenched his sword, and his wand, held in his left hand, was poised to cast a spell at a moment's notice. Who are you? John inquired, as the last piece of what seemed like sawdust adhered to the man's face. The once thick wooden sword in the man's grasp had now transformed into a twig-like wand. Opening his eyes wide, the man's first words were, You must be a Gryffindor, right? Uh, I'm from Slytherin, John corrected. Slytherin? The man looked at John, bewildered. He wielded a large sword in his right hand and a wand in his left, a unique combination for attack. You claim to be from Slytherin? Godric Gryffindor chuckled, then said, Don't jest. You've conquered the test I left behind, and my hat wouldn't have placed you in Slytherin. 
His confidence suggested he thought this was merely a playful remark from the young wizard, but John sensed something amiss. Your hat? The sorting hat? John ventured. Indeed, I am Godric Gryffindor. You may also refer to me as the old headmaster if you prefer, the man introduced himself. Gryffindor, appearing to be in his prime, instinctively reached to stroke his beard before remembering his current youthful form and stopping himself. The founder of one of the four houses? John exclaimed, astounded. You may address me as such. This is the secret chamber I left behind. Impressive, isn't it? How fares Gryffindor these days? Have we triumphed over Slytherin in the House Cup? Gryffindor still believed John to be a Gryffindor student, and upon mentioning his old friend Salazar Slytherin, he couldn't help but snort disdainfully. It was clear that the rivalry between Gryffindor and Slytherin was long-standing, dating back to the founding of Hogwarts. Noticing Gryffindor's evident disdain for Slytherin, John silently gestured to the green and silver on his robes, saying, I truly am a Slytherin. If you doubt me, just look. The vibrant green and silver of his robe stood out, causing Gryffindor's mood to sour instantly. Has my hat malfunctioned, sorting you into Slytherin? Gryffindor wondered aloud, now seriously questioning if there was an issue with his sorting hat. John, unsure of what to say, offered an awkward smile. The revelation that students who passed the test were not necessarily from Gryffindor seemed to unsettle Godric Gryffindor. Nevertheless, the secret chamber was intended for the entire school, designed to identify a worthy successor. Despite the air being from Slytherin, Gryffindor had no choice but to accept it. Well, you have passed the test and are deemed worthy of my inheritance, Gryffindor declared, waving his wand. The fallen doll reverted to its original state and walked into the fireplace, while two chairs materialized out of thin air. Gryffindor seated himself in one, his wand still in hand. As long as you complete my next challenge, I will grant you the power you seek, he continued. John, sitting opposite, hesitated before asking, If I accept your challenge, will I be expelled from Slytherin? Gryffindor responded dismissively, Would expulsion be such a bad thing? After all, pure-blood families are usually not lacking in wealth. But, head of Gryffindor, I'm muggle-born, John revealed. Um, Gryffindor was taken aback. Even as a Slytherin, you're a muggle-born? What has become of Hogwarts in my absence that Slytherin has been infiltrated by muggles? Gryffindor, overwhelmed by this revelation, needed a moment to process the information. The more he pondered, the more perplexed he became. Could it be that Gryffindor and Slytherin have swapped identities? He glanced at John again, considering the possibility more seriously. It became evident that Godric Gryffindor was a figure of significant stature. Both he and Salazar Sly, Therin, characterized by their bravery and calmness respectively, pursued adventure and yearned for magic. Despite their contrasting natures, they were best friends, even in the face of their eventual parting. Days later, they would part ways amicably. Godric Gryffindor, however, didn't dwell on such thoughts. He reassured, Do not fret, my legacy spans the entire school, and you shall not face expulsion. Okay. John sighed in relief upon hearing he wouldn't be expelled. The prospect of inheriting such a legacy was enticing, but expulsion would tarnish any accolades, even in the eyes of a resurrected Voldemort. The trial consists of three parts, the bird in the forest, the lion in the mountain, and the swordsman's courage, Gryffindor explained. I will be observing your performance throughout. As Gryffindor was about to initiate the trial with a wave of his wand, John hesitantly raised his hand to interrupt. I apologize, head of Gryffindor, but I might not be ready at this moment, and it's also past my bedtime. Gryffindor, momentarily taken aback and holding his breath, had his plans interrupted by John's request. After a brief pause, he conceded, then we shall reschedule. Thank you, head of Gryffindor. John bowed respectfully and exited, his heart racing at the thought of the impending trial. Ding! Challenge mission triggered. Gryffindor Legacy Phase 1, The Bird in the Forest. Reward Forest Flyer Blessing. Currently without a single talisman, John was not prepared to take unnecessary risks. Caution was his guiding principle for longevity. He decided to rest and recuperate in his dormitory before facing the trial. The next day, John made his way to the Great Hall for breakfast. The morning spread was lavish, featuring porridge, pickled herring, eggs wrapped in bacon, and more. 
Despite the unusual combination of pickled herring with porridge, John's palate had grown accustomed to such fare over the years. As he enjoyed his breakfast, Daphne Greengrass, a blonde girl, sat beside him, her gaze fixed on his profile. She chuckled softly before mentioning, John, did you know our Defense Against the Dark Arts professor this year is Gilderoy Lockhart? My mother adores him. John, sipping his porridge and pairing it with a slice of bacon, responded indifferently, I've read his book. It's well written, though I'm curious about his teaching abilities. The frequent changes in Defense Against the Dark Arts teachers had resulted in a disparity in student proficiency. John pondered the school's stubbornness in this matter. Why not simply rename the course? Whether it's Defense Against the Dark Arts or Countering Dark Arts, the essence remains the same. The curse on the position, purportedly by Voldemort, shouldn't affect my tenure as a professor, he mused. The previous year's professor, Quirrell, had been lackluster in his teaching, yet John had learned that Quirrell's expertise in dark magic was far from mediocre. He had merely chosen to conceal his true capabilities. Draco Malfoy approached with his entourage, eager to share gossip with John. Potter and that detestable Weasley have landed themselves in trouble again. They arrived at school in a flying car. It's a shame you missed the spectacle in the Great Hall yesterday. The news spread like wildfire, and Gryffindor House celebrated Harry's audacious stunt that night. However, Harry soon realized his folly, especially when Hermione, the most rational among their trio, expressed her disappointment. Her fascination with Gilderoy Lockhart's Travels with Vampires was momentarily overshadowed by her frustration with Harry's recklessness. The arrival of the post brought chaos to the Great Hall, with hundreds of owls swooping in. An elderly owl, belonging to the Weasley family, made a clumsy landing into Hermione's milk jug. Errol, Ron exclaimed, rescuing the disoriented owl and noticing the red envelope in its beak, a howler. John watched with interest, sensing the unfolding drama, especially as Malfoy's attention was captured by the scene. Malfoy Tay earned around abruptly, his expression one of gleeful anticipation, as if he were about to watch an exceptionally entertaining spectacle. Ha ha! A howler letter! Weasley is going to suffer, he gloated, his voice dripping with schadenfreude. The lackey standing beside him mimicked a weeping gesture, adding to the mockery. Ron, on the other hand, was visibly reluctant to open the howler. Neville, trying to be helpful, whispered, You'd better open it, Ron. Ignoring it only makes things worse. My grandmother sent me one once, and when I ignored it, he shuddered, the memory, the memory of the consequences clearly still haunting him. Understanding the gravity of the situation, Ron swallowed hard. He didn't need to imagine the potential fallout. The dread was evident. With hands shaking from apprehension, he finally mustered the courage to open the roaring letter. As soon as he did, a deafening roar filled the entire hall, causing a visible tremor. John, who was observing the chaos, noticed a pinch of ashes fall into his porridge. Seizing the opportunity to avoid Malfoy's attention, he discreetly swapped his bowl with one in front of Malfoy. Malfoy, too engrossed in reveling in Weasley's misfortune, picked up the porridge and drank it with evident satisfaction. However, his enjoyment was short-lived, as the porridge was finished in just a few sips, leaving him wanting more. Chapter 55 Hogwarts Knows the King and the Humping Willow The first class of the day was History of Magic. Before heading to class, John decided to visit the Humping Willow, a tree that had been previously injured by his father. The Humping Willow, a massive and temperamental willow tree located on the grounds of Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, is known for its aggressive behavior towards anything that comes too close, lashing out with its branches at any perceived threat. Upon John's arrival at the Humping Willow, he found two individuals already there. One of them was boasting, I once encountered a Humping Willow during my travels. As long as you do this, stop it, you're only going to make it angrier, the other warned. Don't worry, I'm Gilderoy Lockhart, holder of the Order of Merlin, third class, and possessor of the most charming smile, the first speaker declared confidently. With a flick of his wand, Lockhart attempted a spell, only to infuriate the humping willow further. Professor Sprout, the herbology professor who happened to be nearby, was inadvertently caught in the crossfire and sent flying by the tree. At that moment, 
Professor Sprout was seething with anger towards Lockhart. She couldn't fathom why Dumbledore had allowed this disgraceful former Ravenclaw student to return as a professor. It's all right, Professor Sprout. I've dealt with trolls. This injury is nothing, Lockhart blithely commented. Stop it. Don't come any closer. Professor Sprout, mustering all her strength, quickly moved out of the humping willow's reach. She was genuinely frightened. Lockhart's interference could either result in her being seriously injured by the tree or by her own hand in frustration. Claiming that she needed to prepare for her upcoming class, she urged the bothersome Lockhart to leave immediately. Is this the man who knows everything about defense against the dark arts? John mused, having observed Lockhart's reckless endangerment of a fellow professor. He questioned the wisdom of hiring such a person, especially given the high turnover of Defense Against the Dark Arts professors. Remembering Lockhart's published works, John began to doubt whether the man's public persona matched the reality. Are there charlatans even in the wizarding world? John pondered, his skepticism growing as he approached the humping willow after the others had left. He knew of a secret passage beneath the tree from the Marauder's Map, but getting close was a challenge due to the tree's hostility. As John neared, a branch swung violently towards him. He quickly stepped back, observing the tree's aggressive movements. Its sensitivity and activity could have unexpected benefits if used in amulets, John thought, eyeing the tree's wounds and contemplating how to obtain a piece of it. Without much hesitation, John cast Petrificus Totalis, freezing the tree's thrashing branches. Seizing the moment, he used his flying boots to leap up and cut off some of the damaged branches. After collecting the branches, John activated his flying boots once more and swiftly departed the scene. As the Homping Willow regained its mobility, it thrashed its branches in fury. Ah, well, I'm not going to figure out how to treat you, John reasoned, feeling justified in his actions. To him, taking a small piece from such a large tree seemed inconsequential. Stuffing the branch into his bag, John turned and left feeling that the task of treating the Homping Willow's injuries was better left to a professional, such as Professor Sprout. With class time approaching, John made his way to the History of Magic classroom, his mind still on the events at the Homping Willow and the peculiar defense against the dark arts professor. John was well-versed in the labyrinth of secret passages within Hogwarts, which is why he remained unfazed even as the clock ticked dangerously close to the start of the History of Magic class. With a practice step, he made his entrance into the classroom just in time. Professor Binns, the ghostly instar, uktor of the History of Magic, had long ago forgotten to detach himself from his mortal slumber, resulting in lessons that were as monotonous and lifeless as his spectral appearance. Despite his best efforts, John struggled to keep his eyelids from drooping, Officially, he was there to learn about the history of magic, but his real focus lay on the alchemy notes hidden within his textbook. The afternoon promised a shift in pace with defense against the dark arts. During lunch, Ron lamented over his malfunctioning wand, while Daphne expressed her excitement for the class, influenced by her mother's praise of Professor Lockhart. John, however, harbored no such expectations, especially after witnessing Lockhart's morning spectacle involving Harry. As he carefully peeled and consumed his potato, he couldn't help but notice Malfoy's absence, likely sulking over Harry's latest encounter with Lockhart, which had sparked envy among the Malfoy children. Daphne had forgotten her copy of I Can Be Magical for Lockhart's signature and had gone back to retrieve it. Hermione approached, clutching Lockhart's book, her cheeks tinged with a blush of anticipation. I can't wait to see what kind of exciting class Professor Lockhart has planned, just like the adventures in his book she said, her voice filled with hope. John hesitated, not wanting to crush her spirits. Well, I'm not sure it'll be quite what you're expecting, he gently warned, pondering how the revelation might disillusion Hermione, who was currently basking in her admiration for Lockhart. The scene, John mused, would make for scandalous footage should Hermione ever ascend to the position of Minister of Magic. Meanwhile, Harry found himself in an awkward situation, not only due to Malfoy's taunts, but also because of Lockhart's overbearing presence. Colin Creevy, a first-year Gryffindor and avid Harry Potter fan, eagerly snapped photos of Harry, 
much to his discomfort. Lockhart's insistence on a joint photo only added to Harry's embarrassment. As the afternoon class approached, Lockhart, basking in his perceived success, whisked Harry away, leaving Ron and Hermione behind. John finished his lunch and approached Ron, who was visibly upset after Malfoy's mockery. Ron, don't let it get to you. I heard about your wand, John said, offering a sympathetic ear. Ron, frustrated, showed John the broken wand. Upon inspection, John was relieved to find the core intact. I've been studying wand making. I might be able to fix this for you, he offered, much to Ron's delight. The prospect of avoiding another scolding from Mrs. Weasley was a relief to Ron. We should head to class. I'll start on the wand repair once I've gathered the necessary materials, John promised as they made their way to the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom. The classroom was a stark contrast to the others, adorned with countless photos of Gilderoy Lockhart himself. It was a testament to the professor's vanity. Lockhart's entrance was as flamboyant as his reputation suggested. Clad in a turquoise robe complemented by a matching top hat with a gold rim, his blonde hair gleamed under the classroom lights. His appearance was as ostentatious as the tales of his adventures setting the stage for what was sure to be an unforgettable class. Malfoy's discomfort was palpable as he sneered at the photograph of Lockhart and Harry, his disdain for the celebrity wizard clear. In stark contrast, the girls in the room reacted with visible excitement, their eyes sparkling and cheeks flushed with adoration. Many of them, influenced by their mothers or their own admiration, were fervent fans of Lockhart. Despite being known as a charlatan, Lockhart's charm and good looks were undeniable. He had a knack for self-promotion, as evidenced by his introduction. I am Gilderoy Lockhart, recipient of the Order of Merlin, third class, honorary member of the Dark Force Defense League, and five-time winner of Witch Weekly's Most Charming Smile Award, though I don't like to talk about that. It wasn't my smile that banish, Ed the Banshee from Wan Lun, he boasted, ending with a quip that unfortunately went over the heads of his audience. John could only shake his head in disbelief. Among the litany of self-congratulatory titles, the only one that seemed remotely relevant to teaching was his honorary membership in the Dark Force Defense League. Yet, even that felt superficial. John's skepticism was soon validated when Lockhart revealed the day's activity, a questionnaire about none other than himself. The questions were as follows. 1. What is Gilderoy Lockhart's favorite color? 2. What was Gilderoy Lockhart's secret ambition? 3. What do you consider Gilderoy Lockhart's greatest achievement to date? John was incredulous. These questions seemed more suited to a fan club meeting than a defense against the dark arts class. The absurdity of the situation was not lost on him, as he wondered if they were there to learn or simply to indulge Lockhart's ego. Chapter 56. Wisps and Deterrence Ah, it seems almost no one remembers my fondness for the lilac color, a detail I shared in a year with the Tibetan snowman, Lockhart lamented as he reviewed the test papers. His disappointment was palpable, given the student's failure to answer his simple questions. Yet, he couldn't help but offer a mischievous wink to comfort the young wizards. Ron, along with his classmates, struggled to contain their amusement. Hermione, however, remained the sole figure of concentration in the room, until Lockhart unexpectedly mentioned her name, causing her to startle. But Miss Hermione Granger is aware that my secret ambition is to rid the world of evil and to launch my own line of hair conditioners, Lockhart announced, his surprise turning into relief upon reading Hermione's test paper. Indeed, exceptional individuals always stand out, he remarked joyfully. Where is Miss Hermione Granger? Hermione, her hand shaking, raised it to acknowledge her correct answer. Splendid! Ten points for Gryffindor! Lockhart declared, sending waves of excitement through Hermione. It was her first time earning points ahead of John, and she couldn't help but look at him with a sense of triumphant challenge in her eyes. John sensed something amiss in Hermione's gaze. The once disheartened student seemed reinvigorated, ready to surpass John once more. Unbeknownst to Lockhart, his casual actions had rekindled the competitive spirit in Hermione. Lockhart then placed a large cage, shrouded with a cloth, on the podium. His exaggerated gestures hinted at something ominous. Prepare yourselves. I am here to teach you how to defend against the darkest entities known to the wizarding world. 
you will confront your worst fears in this classroom. His voice carried a hint of menace, designed to instill fear in the young wizards. Sensing he might have overdone it, Lockhart quickly reassured them. But fear not, for as long as I am here you shall be safe. All I ask is for you to remain calm. The class fell silent, their laughter ceasing as some, like Neville in the front row, visibly tensed. Please, try not to scream, it will only provoke them, Lockhart warned, his tone low and foreboding, successfully casting a pall of terror over the room. As Lockhart unveiled the cage, the class held its breath in anticipation. Siemus, who typically maintained his composure, couldn't contain his laughter when, instead of the feared Dementors, a group of Cornish pixies was revealed. These small, iron-blue creatures, with their pointed faces and shrill voices, were more akin to noisy budgerigars than terrifying beasts. Lockhart, embarrassed by Seamus's reaction, defensively claimed, They may be small, but these creatures are as cunning as devils. His attempt to salvage the situation was met with more laughter, much to his chagrin. Well, let's see how you handle them, Lockhart declared, opening the cage to unleash the pixies. Chaos ensued as the pixies darted around the classroom, lifting students by their ears and shattering the window glass. True to Lockhart's words, they wreaked havoc like little demons, spraying ink everywhere. One pixie, daring to approach John, was met with a threatening glare that sent it flying away in terror. Clearly, even the Cornish pixies knew better than to provoke certain individuals. Lockhart, in a desperate attempt to regain control, hastily instructed the students on how to manage the pandemonium. His efforts, however, only highlighted the gap between his boasts and his actual ability to manage magical creatures, much to the amusement and dismay of his students. As the chaos unfolded in the classroom, with elves darting about and students either trying to catch them or avoid being splattered with ink, John had had enough. With a commanding presence, he stood up amidst the disorder, his voice cutting through the noise like a cold blade. Enough, he shouted, and an aura of authority, reminiscent of a dragon's might, radiated from him. This sudden display of power caused the mischievous L, Vest to freeze in their tracks, and even Professor Lockhart caught off guard, yelped in fear, and made a hasty retreat from the room. The elves, overwhelmed by John's presence, trembled and collapsed in a heap, their pitiful state drawing a mix of reactions from the students. John, maintaining his composure, quickly brought an end to the mayhem. With a flick of his wand, he cast a transfiguration spell, that is transforming a nearby table into a cage that corralled the still-escaping elves. As the bell signaling the end of class rang, the students snapped out of their daze, looking around as if waking from a dream. As John made his way to the door, a student's voice broke the silence. Aren't you going to dismiss the class? Right, John replied, acknowledging the oversight. The students' reactions varied. Daphne gazed at John with newfound respect, while Malfoy was momentarily speechless. The Slytherins erupted into cheers, viewing John as the hero who had salvaged the lesson. Cool, that was amazing, exclaimed Seamus from Gryffindor, impressed by John's ability to intimidate the elf into submission. I felt like he was a fire dragon just now. It was just too scary, Harry added, sharing in the awe. Ron, however, was more terrified by the thought of enduring another of Lockhart's classes than by John's display of power. I never want to take Lockhart's class again. It's a nightmare, he declared. Hermione, trying to defend her idol, suggested that Lockhart might have been giving them a chance to practice, but her confidence waned as the conversation continued. The incident highlighted John's understanding of how deterrence could be effectively used against lesser magical creatures. He considered this ability, which stemmed from his natural presence and strength, as a potential magical skill. Later, tasked by Dumbledore with caring for the Humping Willow, John approached the task with a sense of duty. Despite his initial attempt to calm the tree with his presence alone, he resorted to using a petrification spell when his deterrence proved insufficient. After applying dragon dung around the tree, a beneficial treatment for plants, the Whomping Willow settled down. Back in his dormitory, John crafted an amulet from the Whomping Willow's branches designed to alert the wearer to approaching danger. This amulet, sensitive to even the faintest malice, was a testament to John's ingenuity and connection to the magical world around him. With preparations complete, 
including a bag filled with potions for detoxification and fire protection, John set his sights on the Room of Requirement. His mind focused on the challenges ahead. He was ready to push his boundaries and explore the depths of his magical abilities. John tapped his foot on the ground three times, and as he did so, a door materialized in front of him. Stepping inside, he found Gryffindor already waiting. John gave a nod, signaling his readiness. I'm prepared to begin the test, he declared. With a graceful wave of Gryffindor's wand, the Room of Requirement underwent a dramatic transformation. Vines sprouted from the floor, entwining around them, while trees burst forth from the earth, their branches reaching skyward. The transformation unfolded over several moments, and by the time it ceased, John found himself standing in the midst of a vast forest. It was his first encounter with such a use of the Room of Requirement. Had he not witnessed it with his own eyes, he might have believed he had been transported into the heart of the Forbidden Forest. The air was thick with the scent of moss and damp earth, a stark contrast to the usual ambiance of the Room of Requirement. John looked around, marveling at the intricate details of the forest that had been conjured around him. The trees towered above, their leaves whispering secrets in a language only the wind understood. The ground beneath his feet felt alive, pulsating with the magic that had created this place. Gryffindor's presence was a reassuring constant in the ever-changing landscape of the room. Remember, the test will challenge you in ways you might not expect. Stay vigilant, Gryffindor advised, his voice echoing slightly in the vast expanse of the forest. John took a deep breath, feeling the cool air fill his lungs. He was ready for whatever challenges lay ahead his determination fueled by the knowledge that this was no ordinary test. It was a journey through the depths of magic, a testament to the power and creativity that the Room of Requirement held within its walls. Chapter 57, The Quest for the Golden Snidget Gryffindor stood beside John, leaning comfortably against a tree. In this forest, there's a golden bird known as the Golden Snidget. Your task is to find it, he said, a hint of amusement in his voice. John surveyed the vast expanse of the forest, which bore a striking resemblance to the Forbidden Forest. Are you certain it's here? he asked skeptically. Finding anyone in this forest is challenging enough, let alone a snidget that's the size of a golden snitch. Gryffindor's half-smile widened. Of course, it's here. Moreover, you'd better locate it before dusk. The night brings other creatures to the fore, he warned, his tone suggesting he was looking forward to the spectacle. John pondered briefly before embarking on his search. The Snidget, known for its speed and elusiveness, made the task seem daunting, akin to searching for a needle in a haystack. After an extensive search yielded no results, John resorted to a more drastic measure. Pointing his wand at a tree, he cast Reducto. The spell hit the tree, causing it to explode and a flurry of birds to take flight. Despite his careful observation, the golden gleam of the Snidget was nowhere to be seen. Time for a more direct approach, John decided. Donning his flying boots, he soared into the air, casting shattering curses in all directions. The forest shook under the force of the explosions. Gryffindor watched in surprise. He hadn't anticipated such a bold strategy to find the Snidget. Yet upon reflection, he recognized the cleverness in John's method. The Snidget, being highly sensitive and swift, would likely evade danger and reveal itself. A clever wizard indeed, Gryffindor mused, admiring John's pragmatism. However, this method is quite taxing on your magical reserves. Expecting John to exhaust his magic, Gryffindor was taken aback when John retrieved a bottle of recovery potion from his bag and quickly replenished his magical energy. The bombing resumed with renewed vigor. Gryffindor's disbelief grew as John consumed potion after potion, his supply seemingly endless. How does a Muggleborn have access to more potions than even the oldest pureblood families? He wondered aloud. Finally, after another potion, a golden figure darted out from the devastated forest. John's enhanced eyesight locked onto the Snidget, and he gave chase with his flying boots. The Snidget proved to be an elusive target, weaving through the trees with incredible speed. Despite several hours of pursuit, John couldn't close the distance. As darkness fell, Eerie cries filled the forest, and a creature with bird-like feathers and a dragon-like appearance emerged. Without hesitation, John attacked the creature with a precise spell, sending it flying. However, 
more of these bird-shaped ogres appeared, undeterred by his spells and continuing their pursuit. Recognizing the creatures for what they were, John intensified his efforts, blasting a path through them. Seizing the opportunity, he ascended higher, though the Snidget had become a mere speck in the distance. John's relentless pursuit through the forest, his innovative tactics, and his encounter with the mysterious creatures underscored his determination and resourcefulness. As night enveloped the forest, the quest for the Golden Snidget took on a new level of urgency and danger. In the vast sky, John focused intently on the Golden Snidget, casting spells in rapid succession. The Snidget's agility was unparalleled, making it a challenge to capture even with the finest broom, especially amidst the chaos caused by numerous avian predators. John's mind raced for a solution, and in a bold move, he unleashed the fire curse towards the forest below. Tree after tree was consumed by the spreading flames, causing the bird-like monsters to screech in agony as they were engulfed or suffocated by the smoke plummeting to the ground. Amidst the chaos, the Snidget's flight became erratic, its speed hampered by the smoke and flames. Seizing the opportunity, John pushed his flying by oots to their limit, closing in on the Snidget. As its wings faltered, John caught it just before it could fall into the fiery inferno below, successfully completing the trial. However, the victory came at a cost. The forest was ablaze, a sight that made Gryffindor's brow furrow in disapproval. With a sense of responsibility, John conjured a massive orb of water with the Aguamenti spell, directing it towards the flames. Witnessing this act, Gryffindor's expression softened. Although he resorts to drastic measures to succeed, he makes amends once his goal is achieved, Gryffindor thought, acknowledging John's effort to control the fire. Landing before Gryffindor, John opened his palms to reveal the golden snidget, now attempting to regain its composure. You have passed the test of the bird in the woods, Gryffindor announced, nodding in approval before dispelling the forest illusion. Ding, challenge task triggered. Gryffindor Legacy Phase 1, Lion of the Mountain. Reward, points and the blessing of a heavy hit. Lions are known for their courage and strength, but a mountain lion must surpass its peers in might, Gryffindor explained. You must demonstrate your strength to me by climbing this mountain. With a wave of his wand, Gryffindor transformed the Room of Requirement into a towering mountain and proceeded to remove John's alchemical equipment, including his amulet and flying boots. Your skill in alchemy is commendable, but it will not aid you here, Gryffindor stated, emphasizing the need for a fair challenge. John, momentarily taken aback by the sudden change, gazed at the mountain. As he exhaled, his breath turned to mist in the cold air. Is it getting colder? He wondered aloud, noticing the snowflakes beginning to fall. Aware of the urgency, John started his ascent, the snow and wind intensifying with every step. Visibility dwindled until all he could see was a blanket of white. The journey was arduous, and at one point, John encountered a yeti, its white fur blending with the snow. The creature charged, but John skillfully dodged and countered with a spell, sending the yeti tumbling down the mountain in a massive snowball. Believing the ordeal was over, John was startled to find another yeti blocking his path. Refusing to be deterred, John cast a disillusionment charm on himself hoping to bypass the creature unnoticed. However, he underestimated the Yeti's keen sense of smell and was discovered. As the Yeti prepared to attack, John met its gaze with a powerful look of deterrence, freezing it in place. Without hesitation, he drew the iron wick sword, declaring, I am a fire dragon. The blade burst into flames, and with a swift strike, John vanquished the Yeti, clearing his path up the mountain. The white-haired snowman collapsed to the ground, its body igniting with flames from the wound inflicted upon it. It seems that deterrence is effective, John remarked, his eyes narrowing with a dangerous glint. His demeanor shifted from polite to determined as a battalion of snowmen obstructed his path. Gripping his sword with both hands, he bellowed, Come at me! With the activation of his deterrence ability, the snowman facing him stiffened involuntarily. As John's sword, Iron Wick, danced through the air, the movements of the snowman visibly slowed until eventually none remained standing in his vicinity. Clutching his sword firmly, John proceeded up the mountain with resolute steps. This spectacle did not escape Gryffindor's notice. Upon reaching the mountain's summit, 
where the wind and snow ceased their fury, John found Gryffindor awaiting him. The atmosphere was charged with anticipation, signaling that only one final trial remained. John, now recognized as the hero of the sword, prepared to face whatever challenge lay ahead with Gryffindor. Chapter 58, The Sword Hero and the Legacy. Ding, challenge mission triggered. Gryffindor Legacy Stage 1, Hero of the Sword. Earn any reward point, blessing seeker. As Gaoshan vanished, they found themselves back on the original training ground. Gryffindor stood to the side, clapping his hands. I must admit, I didn't expect you to make it this far, he said, a hint of admiration in his voice. This is the final test, Master Mode. Master Mode? John glanced at Gryffindor, uncertain. With his current level of strength, it was unclear whether he could triumph in Master Mode. Yet, he felt a surge of confidence, believing he could breeze through the combination of difficult modes once more, especially with the alchemy equipment Gryffindor had returned to him and the amulet's assistance. Suddenly, Master Mode commenced. John half expected another dummy opponent, but instead, Gryffindor himself stepped into the center of the training ground. Come on, Gryffindor beckoned. John was momentarily stunned. Gryffindor was the opponent for Master Mode? The thought was daunting, despite his significant improvement since his first year, facing one of Hogwarts' four founders, especially Gryffindor, known for his dueling prowess, seemed insurmountable. Yet, having overcome two challenging hurdles, John couldn't back down now. With a heavy heart, he approached the training ground. Gryffindor stood ready, wielding only a wand that resembled a simple branch. I admire your bravery, Gryffindor said with a chuckle. Don't worry, I'm not at my full strength, and I'm not as formidable as you might imagine. John found Gryffindor's attempt at reassurance slightly exaggerated, but appreciated the gesture nonetheless. Just a moment, please, he said, retrieving a small bag and extracting an enhancement potion. Under Gryffindor's watchful eye, John consumed the potion. Gryffindor observed with mild amusement. Drinking potions before a battle seemed overly cautious, but he wondered how much it would actually aid the young wizard. For the next half minute, Gryffindor watched as John consumed an array of potions, Felicity Elixir, Fire Resistance, Enhancement, Restoration, anything that could bolster his strength. I'm ready, John declared, now radiating power, sword in his right hand and wand in his left. Gryffindor, seeing his reflection in the young wizard's determination, smiled and raised his wand to his chest. I hope your teacher taught you how to duel, he said, emphasizing the importance of saluting one's opponent before a duel. John reciprocated the gesture, placing his wand on his chest. After exchanging salutes, they turned and took steps away from each other. At the count of ten, John spun around, only to be met with a red light speeding towards him. The amulet activated instantly, and the iron armor curse shielded him from the attack. John felt a chill run down his spine at the speed of the assault. Interesting little artifact, Gryffindor commented, launching another spell. He demonstrated the skill of a true dueling master, and even at a fraction of his full strength, his vast experience posed a significant challenge for John. The amulet activated once more, prompting John to realize he couldn't remain on the defensive. He began to counterattack, his wand and sword moving in harmony. I am a fire dragon, he declared, his sword igniting as he cleaved through the incoming red light, deflecting the next spell with his wand. The battle intensified, with white and red lights weaving a dazzling display. Gryffindor, intrigued, intensified his assault, but John adeptly parried the spell, causing an explosion on the training ground. Debris transformed into a makeshift weapon, striking John from behind. Despite the surprise attack, John's resolve only hardened, ready to prove his worth in this ultimate test of skill and courage. Caught off guard, John activated his amulet but was still launched into the air. Gryffindor seized the moment, casting Opugno, transforming the objects on the training ground into a swarm of birds that rushed towards John. In response, John spun around, unleashing a flame spell to intercept them, Yet some of the birds managed to breach his defenses, striking him and causing pain in his shoulder. Despite the discomfort, John gritted his teeth and persevered, casting the shattering curse with his left hand towards Gryffindor, who easily deflected it. Gryffindor, with a swift motion, transfigured two stools into lions that charged at John. John rolled away, 
narrowly avoiding their attacks while wielding his greatsword. Throughout this exchange, Gryffindor remained stationary, offering advice. Pay attention to the coordination of your movements, your spellcasting, and the timing of your attacks, he instructed. Taking the advice to heart, John cast the Iron Armor Curse to bolster his defenses, allowing him to recalibrate his attack strategy. Breathing heavily, John faced a new challenge as Gryffindor's wand emitted a lightning-like whip. John parried and dodged, but Gryffindor's relentless assault continued, culminating in a spell that struck John's wrist, sending the Sword of Iron Wick flying from his grasp. In a desperate bid, John directed his wand at the sword, causing it to veer away just as Gryffindor attempted to catch it, forcing Gryffindor to retreat. Seizing the moment, John intensified his attack, like utilizing his proficiency in level 3 transfiguration to transform his wand into a puppy that latched onto Gryffindor's calf. Gryffindor managed to dislodge the puppy, but John was already launching another spell. Fuchsia, he exclaimed, casting a spell that sent Gryffindor flying backwards, as if invisible hands had lifted him by his feet. Despite being the dueling champion, Gryffindor quickly retaliated, casting a spell that immobilized John's legs. In a decisive move, John launched a dual spell, Expelliarmus and Petrificus Totalus. The spells collided mid-air, creating a spectacle reminiscent of clashing lightning. In this critical moment, John's eyes transformed, adopting vertical pupils, as he summoned the Sword of Iron Wick with a surge of magical power. Gryffindor, momentarily immobilized, attempted to deflect the incoming sword with his wand, but both he and the sword were repelled. With Gryffindor incapacitated, John cast another spell, knocking Gryffindor's wand from his grasp. The lions, now mere inches from John, reverted back into chairs and collapsed to the ground. Okay, you win, Gryffindor conceded, acknowledging his defeat despite being at a fraction of his full strength and relying solely on his wand. That fuchsia charm is intriguing, Gryffindor remarked, admitting he had never seen it before, as it was a creation of Snape's. Once the petrification spell was lifted, Gryffindor stood, appearing unharmed, while John, the victor, was visibly exhausted. Reflecting on his ability to manipulate the Sword of Iron Wick without a wand, John was puzzled. Interesting, I didn't expect you to be capable of casting spells without a wand at your age. I underestimated you, Gryffindor praised, leaving John bewildered by his own feet. Scratching his head in confusion, John eagerly asked, Did I pass? Gryffindor's affirmative nod filled John with excitement, marking the beginning of his legacy. The mere thought of the Big Four was exhilarating. Gryffindor, with a hint of pride in his voice, announced, You will receive an extremely powerful sword, the very weapon I wielded. John, after a moment of hesitation and observing Gryffindor's confident demeanor, cautiously inquired, You're not referring to the sword of Gryffindor, are you? Indeed I am, Gryffindor responded with enthusiasm. The sword was his prized possession, crafted specifically for him by the Goblin King, a testament to its formidable power. John felt a wave of disappointment. After all this time, the revelation that the promised weapon was the Sword of Gryffindor, which currently resided with Dumbledore, was disheartening. Unlike Harry, John couldn't simply take the sword. Such an act would be tantamount to rebellion. It da, net on him, that Gryffindor's promise was more of a predicament than a gift. With a sense of resignation, John mentioned, I've seen the sword before. It's in the possession of Headmaster Dumbledore. Gryffindor, momentarily taken aback, then remembered that he had indeed entrusted the sword to Hogwarts for safekeeping. Noticing John's look of frustration, Gryffindor felt a twinge of embarrassment. In an attempt to make amends, Gryffindor suggested, How about I teach you to forge a sword yourself? Despite his seemingly carefree nature, Gryffindor was renowned for his exceptional spellcasting and crafting abilities. As a form of compensation for the unattainable sword of Gryffindor, Gryffindor waved his wand, transforming the surroundings once more. This time, they were not transported to a forest or a mountain, but to a cozy room. This room, known as the Chamber of Secrets, was where Gryffindor had lived. It housed all the knowledge he had left behind, representing his most valuable legacy. Within this chamber, John was about to embark on a journey of discovery, learning not just the art of sword forging, but also gaining insight into the depth of Gryffindor's wisdom and skills. This unexpected turn of events 
offered a glimmer of hope, suggesting that sometimes the greatest treasures are not the ones we initially seek, but the knowledge and skills we acquire along the way. Chapter 59, Neville's Transformation and the Encounter with the Eccentric Girl I hope you can cherish this place and strive to become an exceptional and compassionate wizard, Gryffindor's essence conveyed, even as his form began to disintegrate into sawdust. John, witnessing this, inquired with a hint of sorrow, Are you leaving? My son, I have long passed, and what you see before you is merely a fragment of my soul, Gryffindor explained, his visage marked by a red beard emerging amidst the falling sawdust. He gazed at John with warmth and added, In you, I see a bright future for the wizarding world. Your talents are immense. Thank you, founder Gryffindor, John expressed his gratitude genuinely. Despite their brief acquaintance, Gryffindor's strength and magnanimity had left a profound impression on him. As Gryffindor's form neared complete dissipation, he suddenly cursed. That blasted sorting hat! It must have been malfunctioning to place you in Slytherin. Had Gryffindor been alive, he might have considered dunking the sorting hat in water to cleanse it of any possible dust clogging its judgment. John, feeling a bit sheepish, didn't dwell much on the sorting hat's decision. After all, he was already a Slytherin and had accepted his fate. Once Gryffindor vanished, the training ground transformed into a cozy room. John discovered a tome detailing Gryffindor's spellcasting techniques, akin to a treasure trove of knowledge. Among the finds was a manual on Gryffindor's magic swordsmanship, revealing the depth of skill required to master it. John, realizing the fortune of his victory, pocketed the book, eager to learn from it. In the Great Hall, John hastily consumed his breakfast, still weary from the previous night's trials. On his way back then, he had narrowly escaped detection by his housemaster, thanks to a well-timed illusion spell. Observing Neville's bruised face, John offered, Neville, you should stand up for yourself. Neville's swollen cheeks were a clear testament to Malfoy's handiwork. Thank you, John. I wish I could, but I'm not strong enough, Neville admitted. John, seeing an opportunity, asked, Do you want to become stronger? So strong that no one can bully you again. His earnestness convinced Neville to consider the proposition seriously. After class, meet me by the humping willow, John instructed, leaving Neville with a parting thought. You are far from mediocre, Neville. You simply haven't discovered your strength yet. Throughout the day, Neville was preoccupied with John's words, his concentration wavering, even during Professor Flitwick's class. After the day's lessons, John, having effortlessly mastered a transfiguration assignment, contemplated his next steps. Gryffindor's legacy had granted him additional skill points, but he decided to reserve them for the time being. On his way to the Humping Willow, John encountered Daphne. Heading to Quidditch practice? She inquired, her tone laced with curiosity. Daphne hinted at a significant development. Draco's father had donated a new batch of broomsticks to the Slytherin team, a fact that intrigued John, but also reminded him of the task at hand. The Quidditch team had caught John's attention, especially after being praised for his flying skills in his first year. You flew very well in the first grade. Maybe you should try out, someone suggested. However, John expressed his lack of interest due to time constraints. He couldn't help but shake his head in disbelief upon hearing that Malfoy might resort to using his wealth to secure a position on the team. It seemed unnecessary to John, even without financial influence, Malfoy's flying skills were more than adequate for him to earn the seeker position on merit alone. This situation underscored the pervasive influence of money, possibly allowing Malfoy to quickly secure a key role on the team. When Daphne realized John wasn't interested in Quidditch, she shifted the conversation to the new Defense Against the Dark Arts professor. She had hoped for a competent instro, Kitor, but was quickly disillusioned after attending Lockhart's class. I told my mum, and she didn't believe it. It was too bad, Daphne lamented, with John nodding in agreement. Daphne whimsically suggested that John could serve as a substitute teacher, a notion he found amusing yet unrealistic. After their conversation, John made his way to the Humping Willow, where he encountered not Neville, whom he was expecting, but a young girl instead. She was curiously searching for something near the dangerous tree. John warned her about the Humping Willow's violent tendencies, and she turned to him with a dreamy voice, 
introducing herself as Luna Lovegood while searching for a horned, snoring beast. John was taken aback by her eccentric appearance, marked by Ravenclaw robes, a necklace of butterbeer corks, and unusual earrings. Despite her oddities, John found her company pleasant. John and Luna's conversation was interrupted when he noticed a secret path beneath the Homping Willow, a discovery that piqued Luna's curiosity. John, aware of its destination to the Shrieking Shack thanks to the Marauder's Map, casually suggested it might lead to a haunted house. His exploration was cut short by Neville's arrival, out of breath and slightly embarrassed to see Luna there. John introduced Luna to Neville, who greeted her shyly. With the introductions out of the way, John turned his attention back to the secret passage, but instead, he decided to focus on the task at hand. Smiling kindly at Neville, he said, Then let's start the first training. The word training caught Neville off guard, but John reassured him, Yes, it's to make you stronger. This marked the beginning of an unexpected but promising adventure for the trio. John took the lead, with Neville close behind, and Luna trailing behind them, drawn by her innate curiosity. As they approached the humping willow, Neville cast a wary glance towards the dark entrance hidden at its base. Sensing his apprehension, John clapped a reassuring hand on his shoulder and said with a relaxed smile, Don't worry, there won't be any ghosts. Well, unless Peeves has decided to make this his new home. The mere mention of Peeves caused Neville's unease to intensify. Despite his reluctance, Neville found himself being gently nudged to take the lead into the tunnel, with John following closely behind. Luna, ever fascinated by the unknown, eagerly entered after them. The passage was shrouded in darkness, amplifying Neville's fear. It was clear he had forgotten to cast the Lumos charm in his nervous state. John, noticing this, reminded him gently. After a few tense attempts, Neville successfully cast the spell, and the wand's light pierced the darkness. The illuminated path seemed to bolster his courage, and the trio proceeded with a bit more confidence. Chapter 60 The Boggart and the Stargazers The passage was narrow and cramped, forcing the trio to walk in single file. Neville, leading the way, couldn't help but voice his growing apprehension. Where does this lead? John, trailing behind, replied nonchalantly, A haunted house. What? Neville stopped dead in his tracks upon hearing it was a haunted house. John gave him a reassuring pat on the back. Don't worry, I'm here. Neville wanted to protest that John's presence did little to alleviate his fears. But before he could, Luna chimed in with a sing-song voice. There are ghosts in Hogwarts, aren't there? Among the three, only Neville seemed genuinely frightened, which only served to amplify his self-loathing for his own timidity. Gathering his courage, he pressed on, eventually emerging into a house that seemed to embody the essence of neglect and decay. The wallpaper was peeling, the furniture smashed and broken, and the windows were boarded up, casting the room into shadows. It was the quintessential haunted house, right down to the wallpaper that looked as though it had been clawed at by some unseen terror. John noticed Luna gravitating closer to him. He had forgotten that, unlike him, she didn't have the advantage of seeing in the dark. Lumos, he whispered, and the comforting glow of his wand lit up the room. The house, steeped in darkness, seemed to whisper secrets of its past. Wanting to challenge Neville's fears, John suggested, let's split up and explore. Neville, despite the lump in his throat, nodded and ventured forth, his resolve hardening with each step. John watched him go, then turned his attention to the remnants of luxury buried beneath layers of dust and decay. Pushing open a creaking wooden door, John and Luna discovered what appeared to be a kitchen, its view obscured by the boarded-up windows that hinted at the presence of trees outside. We should check on Neville. He's probably terrified by now, Luna observed, her insight cutting through the silence. John agreed, though he felt a twinge of guilt at the thought of Neville's fear. They hadn't gone far when Neville's panicked voice reached them. Professor Snape, I didn't mean to. No need to explain, Neville Longbottom. Because of you, Gryffindor has been deducted 100 points. The voice, cold and unforgiving, belonged to Professor Snape. Neville, imagining the scorn he would face from his housemates, cowered in fear as the figure advanced. John, sensing something amiss, burst through the door. Stupefy. The spell struck the figure, revealing it not to be Snape but a boggart, 
a creature that morphed into one's greatest fear. Neville was aghast, believing John had attacked a professor. But as they watched, the boggart transformed again, this time into a plate of stargazing pie with four dead fish heads protruding from it, before vanishing completely. John, recognizing the creature, explained, It's a boggart. They become whatever we're most afraid of. The revelation brought a mix of relief and curiosity. The encounter with the boggart, though frightening, had taught them an important lesson about facing their fears. And as they left the haunted house behind, the trio couldn't help but feel a little braver than before. John understood Neville's fear of Professor Snape, but he was puzzled by his own fear of the stargazers. After a moment of contemplation, he realized that his constant practice of occlumency might have influenced the boggart to transform into the dark dish he detested. He was momentarily speechless, casting a glance at the cabinet where boggarts preferred to lurk in dark, cramped spaces. With a decisive kick, John sent the stargazing pie back into the cabinet and secured it with a flick of his wand. Neville, it's all right, that was just a boggart. But why did you think of Professor Snape just now? It's quite surprising that you'd conjure him up in this situation, John said, his expression a mix of curiosity and concern. Neville, looking somewhat embarrassed, hesitated before replying, I remembered being docked points last year, and I feared Professor Snape might be lurking in the room, ready to deduct more points. John sympathized with Neville's predicament. Being penalized for trying to help Harry had left a deep psychological scar on him, especially since it was actually Professor McGonagall, not Snape, who had deducted the points. John wondered why Neville's mind immediately went to Snape. Turning to Luna, John noticed her fascination with the boggart, innocently believing it could transform into something as benign as a fish pie. Deciding it was time to conclude their adventure, especially with nightfall approaching and the presence of a first-year student among them, John led the way back to the castle. Along the way, Neville narrowly escaped an encounter with the humping willow, saved by John's quick reflexes. After safely returning to the castle and parting ways, Luna thanked John for the adventure, her voice light and dreamy. John hinted at the many wonders Hogwarts had to offer before heading to the Room of Requirement for training. While training, John's thoughts drifted to Neville. He considered the idea of finding a more suitable weapon for Neville, envisioning him as a sword master capable of destroying horcruxes. With his skills in alchemy and Gryffindor's casting techniques, John crafted a rudimentary sword as a training tool for Neville. The next morning, John presented the sword to Neville, suggesting he might indeed be a sword master. Neville was taken aback, unsure of how to respond, but John encouraged him to embrace sword training and aspire to greatness. Meanwhile, Hermione's unwavering dedication to reading Lockhart's book, despite a disappointing lesson, impressed John. He hoped she would soon see through Lockhart's facade. Heading to class, John pondered over Professor Snape's persistent coldness towards him, despite his contributions to earning points for their house. On his way, he encountered Malfoy, who smugly hinted at an upcoming humiliation for the Gryffindor Quidditch team, boasting about the superior Nimbus 2001 brooms his father had sponsored for the Slytherin team. Malfoy's disdain for the Gryffindor team's equipment only fueled John's determination to prove him wrong. John could almost visualize the day he would lead Slytherin to victory, securing the house trophy. This vision filled him with a sense of pride and determination. However, a part of him felt a twinge of embarrassment at the thought of discussing this dream with Harry. After all, with Harry Potter in the picture, achieving such a feat might prove to be more challenging than he anticipated. Harry was, undeniably, the protagonist of their story, a fact that could not be overlooked.